Well, thank you all for being there at this time on Friday. And I can tell you that when we had the discussion in the dark, dialogue in the dark, the first thing that everybody said um, was that actually that made us feel like a real team. Um, it was amazing how much that enabled you to share your experiences. So we've got a very rich discussion to try to feed back to you today um, and also to bring a little bit of the individual points of view of the great panelists up here. Um, on my right, just let me introduce everybody briefly. We have um, Kevin Snyder from uh, global managing partner of McKinsey, um, who have done a lot of the um, research that uh, you're going to talk about in a minute, Kevin. Um, we have Mika here on the right, who's CEO of Jessina. Um, and on my left, we have Antoine, uh, BMP Paribas, head of global engagement. We have Kathleen Tregoning uh, from Sanofi, vice president globally of external affairs. And known to us all, Maurice Levy, uh, chairman of Publicis. So we'll just get right into it straight away, I think. Um, Kevin, do you want to kick us off with some sure. insights from the research? No, happy to do so. I thought you were going to say about CEOs in the dark, that that's where we usually are. <laughs> um, and that certainly would have resonated. First and foremost, this is the 11th year we've had the chance to do this report. And it's a report that draws on a number of sources, including some surveys we do that have about a million uh, data points in them. And as we look at this year, one of the things that's worth saying is there's some progress. We've been making progress on this issue. Uh, participation rates for women in the workforce are now at about 47%, up from 44%. But let's remember, 47% is way short of the 51% that it should be in a world of equal opportunity. Moreover, if we look at uh, low-wage jobs, or frankly, unpaid jobs, women are about 64% of unpaid labor. That's not where I think we all want it to be. And if you think about seats on corporate boards in France, that's gone from 26 to 40%, so that's progress. But if you actually look at women in the executive office, it's at 17%. And 17%, gosh, we're going to be waiting around for a long time for equality to occur. So more needs to happen. Kevin, and were the surprises here? That well, I think there's some surprise that, but I think the biggest surprise is if you actually look at the impact of technology. Because one of the things that we're obviously looking at is we're in a world now where technology is reshaping employment. About 60% of all the jobs that we have will see at least 30% of their activities automated. You could have thought that that could be a, a real challenge because we've already got underrepresentation for women. And that's Actually, typically it's the not. lens, isn't it? That's and I think many people are assuming that it's, it's going to be a problem. It doesn't have to be. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. In fact, if women just hold their share of the jobs that are out there, and we look at those most likely to be automated, less likely to be automated, most impacted by technology or not, actually what you see is that it will make a small positive difference to women in the workforce. But here's the thing, and here's the challenge that we all have. That will occur, but remember that's because of things like healthcare jobs, where women are in the majority. But technology-related jobs, IT, women are only 42% of those roles. Leadership positions, a minority. And so it's really important that reskilling, which is going to be the case for all parts of the labor force, has to ensure that women get reskilled too. And I think that's maybe not the surprise, but that's the biggest call out I would offer up from this okay, report. Okay, so you see reskilling as really central to turning what we're learning from the numbers into something that is a trend and progress, further progress. It's within. fundamental if this is going to be an opportunity and not a problem. And it's going to have to take many actions. I'm sure we'll talk about those oh. actions, but a lot of leadership actions, leveling the playing field in terms of making sure women have access to the training and development that's most relevant to the reskilling that's going to occur creating the career paths into STEM subjects, technology-based subjects, and really also thinking hard about how do the career paths that women take, how are they dynamic to accommodate on-ramps and off-ramps as people take breaks? That's all going to have to occur at a time of technology change, and I think that's the call to action for everyone in this room. Thank you. I think we're going to dig more into to the research sure. as we... And also, I think one of the things you mentioned was transparency. And so maybe I could just turn to you, Maker, and ask you a little bit about you know, uh, the reskilling, the transparency. How do you see what Kevin's talking about play out in real life in your business? Well, um, actually, transparency is key. 
Because, and, and not only uh, for women, but also for men, and for the fact that to be very fair to everybody and to bring the new, the, uh, the level of information at the same scale for everybody. We have done a lot on that side. We are a listed company. We, of course, applied the, uh, the French law of Copesi Merman uh, at the board level, and I must pay a tribute to our board members. Today, we have a balanced 50 50 men and women at the board level. We have 33% of women at the executive committee. It is not enough, but it's twice the, uh, the percentage you mentioned. We have 45% of women at our management committee. We promoted a lot of people. We encourage men and women, diversity at large, actually, in our organization. But globally speaking, information, transparency, all the reporting we are doing to the market, and considering that everything is part of our holistic view of being profitable, but also acting for environment, diversity, and gender uh, in general. So when we were talking, you were telling me about all these things that you've been doing in the company. So just in the spirit of challenge, what's next? How do you, you, know, how do you go on from there? Th that is a, th this is a very good question that gives me a little bit of time to think it through. Uh, but more, <laughs> more seriously, um, this is really what we would like to do. And we do not want to wait anymore for laws to change and new ideas come up. We would like to scale up by ourselves. And what we want to do, we have created a network in our organization, which is Open Your Eye. The name is Open Your Eye, which is a diverse men and women global network. I would like every single person in our organization being a member of this network, Open Your Eye, as most on the diversity at large. And we would like to take a commitment for the future and is to consider that this internal network will work uh, alongside with the Duchess of Luxembourg to work on um, uh, struggling against uh, violence to women all over the world. At our scale, we're going to put all our energy on that, men and women in the organization. Okay, so you have challenges ahead of you. Yes, please do. <clears throat> we're going to come back to, to some of the things about how that happens and the sorts of learnings that we can all share in terms of the, um, you know, how we can transfer those across sectors. We have a panel here that are from very, very different areas, um, you know, services, uh, property, um, and, um, and banking. So, Antoine, just tell me a bit about, you know, how this challenge of disruption, has that made um, you react in a particular way when you're thinking about how you uh, try to reach the goals of parity, when you try to um, upskill? How has that lens worked and, and how are you addressing it? If you want to, to upscale, you have to make it uh, part of your business model, to encompass it uh, in the way you are, you are doing business. So what we are doing is making sustainability part of our business models through having the, the SDGs of the United Nations part of our corporate platform and we have corporate goals with KPIs that derive from those objectives and you know that among those objectives there is one, there is one which is very important and very uh, dear to us uh, which is uh, gender equality. So because we have uh, this objective, we have KPIs and we also have strong commitments. For example, our CEO Jean-Laurent Bonafé is a, a he for she thematic champion. He is one of the, of the champions of the United uh, Nations uh, program for, the, for gender equality. So he had to go uh, to the tribune of the United Nations, which is something uh, uh, quite... Uh, very public stance. Very public and also, uh, I believe, very uh, impressive. Uh, although he was not that impressed, but that's his, uh, his problem. Uh, but he was, uh, he was very, uh, he took very strong commitment. Uh, and among uh, those commitments, for example, you have the fact that uh, we have some businesses where there is a huge majority of men, and, uh, such as uh, capital markets, for example, and businesses where there is a huge majority of women, uh, such as human resources. And he has taken the public commitment uh, to improve the balance uh, of this. It's, a, it's an example. So you're talking about um, areas where one could say, a bit reductive, but traditionally there are high percentages of women 
others where there are high percentages of men and equalize those yes. to achieve the balance. Uh, abs- and, and what you were telling me earlier is that that's a very, it's important to have that public transparency externally from the business as well as the internal communication in order to make it stick, is that correct? It's absolutely essential, and, uh, but you have to uh, align communications and what you do in the reality, and, uh, uh, and probably it makes you do a lot of progress. For example, uh, we have uh, uh, created a real BNP Paribas uh, social model uh, around our, our 76 countries. We have signed an agreement, a global agreement, with the trade unions, that applies to our 76 countries. And uh, part of this agreement was designed to make clear that we want our organization to be attractive for women in our 76 countries. I give an example. Uh, We uh, uh, decided we are in countries where uh, there is no uh, maternity leave Uh or a very short maternity leave. And we have decided that in any part of the world, any employee of BNP Paribas would have at least 14 weeks of maternity leave. And by doing so, we did improve the duration of the maternity leave in 30 countries uh, where we are located. So I think that's really interesting because what you said to me earlier is it's so important to try to find you know, a mix between a declaration, something that could be viewed as the company branding itself or, and turning it into something which is a hard, measurable result um, in terms of the business core. Is that... Yes, that, uh, that's, exactly, uh, that's exactly the point. And another point, but we can go to it further, is that we are a bank and uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, means uh, for us to promote gender uh, equality, not only in the way we work, but uh, in, in the way we finance the, the economy. For example, you have in this room uh, Marie-Claire Capobianco, who is the head of uh, uh, our French uh, network, and she decided uh, that we would have a two billion uh, envelope that would be dedicated specifically to women entrepreneurship. So taking this decision was telling to everybody, and it was, it's a KPI, it's something very strong and very efficient, and at the same time, it's also uh, telling to the people of the bank, even if they are gentlemen, okay guys, you have uh, this in your KPIs, and I tell you that you have to do this. So just... So we're hearing about some themes here that I think you've all been touching on. Um, The the transparency, the senior leadership, the um, ability to turn that into real action internally and mixing the internal and the external. Kathleen, how can you bring this back to our discussion around around the disruption that's taking place, the, the pressures? I know you were talking about your supply chain and the whole value chain of your business is radically impacted. Exactly. We're in the biopharmaceutical industry. We are facing disruption from technology all through how we uh, do research to development, to how we manufacture, to how we ensure that we're working with precision medicine and the huge amounts of data that we have to get the right products to the right patients. And as part of that, you know, to the, to the point of the discussion, um, this is a business imperative to ensure that we are able to innovate all along that value chain. And innovation can really only happen when you are harnessing different perspectives, different experiences, uh, and different backgrounds. And so for us at Sanofi, this inclusion, diversity, inclusion, and gender balance is its part of how we need to do business to be successful in the future, which is why this week we've announced our commitment to reaching 50-50 gender balance among our senior leaders, our top 1,900 leaders. Um, well. How... how- What are your plans? What is your thinking about how you will make that stick? Um, Because that was one of the big pieces of discussion, I think. How do we get this to be sustainable change? Right. We talked about the importance of setting the ambition and then having the the processes and the commitment. And that commitment extends from our CEO to our executive committee, which is 20% women, through our gender balance board, which is an internal organization that really helps drive these initiatives forward, but also to the programs we have. We have a, a global leadership development program program for women called Elevate so that we can ensure we're 
equipping women with the skills that they need to be successful in this disruptive environment. So we've got a number of metrics and commitments that we have to make sure that it's not just a declaration, but that we meet that goal by our, our 2025 target. And, and how do you how do you um, you know convey the goals and engage mm -hmm. your employees in helping you achieve those themselves? How, what's their part? What's their responsibility within it? Well, this is something that we've communicated internally. Again, we have we've got a great delegation here at the Women's Forum. We have a whole campaign internally around gender balance, harnessing both men and women to understand and live the importance of this inclusion for innovation. That again, this comes back to, this is a business imperative for us to be successful in the future. Okay, and, and Maurice, you were um, a big challenger, I think, during our discussions earlier, and you, you challenged us to, to look at things you know, differently and to, to think about how we might um, bring a different vision to things. You see a lot of different types of companies, a lot of different sectors around both transparency and communication. What would your, what's your thinking? What's your advice to companies? Uh, Julia, maybe before talking about uh, communication, I would say a few words on gender balance. Sure, please. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that this should not be an issue and this should not exist anymore. It should be something absolutely normal that every company should include uh, and not fight for. And we know that there is a lot of resistance for a lot of uh, reasons. Uh, and there are some areas where it is relatively simple. When it comes to top board, it's relatively simple because you have people who have a term and when there is a, uh, people coming to the end of the term, you can hire new directors and this can re rebalance the, the, uh, the equilibrium. So this is something which is relatively easy. The most difficult part mm -hmm. is uh, executive committee. We at Publicis, we have for more than 10 years at the top board 50-50. Uh, even more, I don't remember exactly when it started. And we have uh, uh, at executive committee something like 40%. And we are not completely satisfied and we believe that we should reach uh, the 50%. And uh, to get there, we need to have a clear policy and to have also that clear policy made known to everyone that it is something which is part of what we want to achieve. And this is leading to the communication program. And today in communication, there is no excuse to do not communicate correctly. People who say, okay, I try to explain and uh, I'm not heard or I have not been understood. This is something which should not exist simply because there are tools which help communicating uh, uh, in a way which is very easy, interactive, and people can react and you can adjust. If you make a mistake, you can adjust. So everything starts and this has been said. Uh, Kevin said it, uh, Maker. Uh, Everyone said it, uh, Antoine also, it has to start with uh, uh, the, the policy of the company. It has to start, call it business plan, call it objective, call it corporate policies, whatever it is, and it has to be clear for everyone. And you have to make the decision extremely clear. It's, it, it should not be just for talk. And then you have to start by communicating to everyone, not only to the top management, not only to executive committee, to the top 2,000 people or whatever in each organization, you have to go top down to every single person, including the people who are in the mail rooms. And you have to communicate outside because the credibility of what you say inside is reinforced when you say the thing outside. And when you have KPIs and you go back to uh, you shareholders, uh, you go back to the analyst, you go back to the investors, and every time you are communicating on your result and you explain what you are doing on a few items, including this one. And I think that if you do it right, uh, you will achieve some result. This doesn't mean that you will not have resistance because it's complicated, 
but you may have some resistance and you have to go over that resistance. How do you do that? Is it a question of constancy? Is it a question of the, the type of communication? Is it a question of you know, transparency about information? Or how, how does that work? Transparency is key. Mm -hmm. So you have to be transparent, and that is the reason why you have to set goals, you have to insist, and you have to persist, uh, and to repeat. And uh, in this kind of field, it doesn't suffice to say, okay, we are going to do it, and uh, it's just uh, something that uh, you, you post on, on your website, and it's a nice thing to do. To show, you have to measure, and when you are not where you have to be, you have to correct. And persistence is a good quality in this field. Okay. Well, I, I, I think that, um, you know, that's a great note to turn back to Kevin, and maybe to bring you all in on a discussion of our workshop earlier on, because it was a very rich discussion. We had a lot of, um, a, a lot of insights, I think, from, from different types of organizations. I mean, Kevin, what struck you from that discussion that um, resonated with your findings in the report? Because you were very clear in the report, there were five, and I would really recommend everybody to take a look, particularly at the page where there were five key things that make a difference. Yes, and one of them we've talked a lot about, transparency and all that goes with it. Uh, we've talked a lot, I think, about skill building and how you develop people and give them the chance. But one thing which the report touches on, but which I believe is absolutely essential here, and we've sort of danced around, but I think you hear all the time, is it also matters that this is deeply personal. Mm -hmm. Make it personal. What do I mean by that? All of us have reasons why we deeply care about this subject. It's not just that it's a business imperative. It is. It's not just that we think it's the right thing to do. It is. It's because we all have personal stories of why, why this matters. If, you know, very quickly, my story is simple. Uh, I married a wonderful woman called Amy. We met at business school. The day I married her, she said to me, you know, I didn't go to business school to meet you. I went to business school to have a career. So she's always wanted to have a career. We happened to join McKinsey and Company together as a buy one, get one free. I was free. She was the, the, the talented one. She spoke Japanese. That's why we're in Asia. But here's the thing. She didn't change her name. So she's Amy Muntner. I'm Kevin Sneeder. I got to watch what it was like to be a young woman in London in a professional career where I thought everybody had high standards late at night in the bar. They don't have high standards. When the, progress, you know, when the performance review says you're being too aggressive. So some of this I lived, and I think we've all got stories like that. And so as I go around and talk to other men, when we write that leadership commitment, which is one of the five, the leadership commitment is there is because it's deeply personal to all of us. It's very personal to me that we change what's going on and that we find ways to address the issues that are emerging. And so it's not just some abstract business imperative, it's personal, we have to get it right, and all of us care. I'm sure there are a lot of personal, um, personal stories, and I know that it takes a lot to be behind something and really make it change. I mean, how have you lived that? I mean, who wants to come in? Antoine, how have you lived that, that personal? Oh, person, personally, I live that very well. But uh, uh, what I believe is that I what is important is uh, to, to say that it's, we, not, we don't have only uh, gender balance disruption to do. It has to be part of the disruption. It's an element Itself. of the disruption. I, I, okay. I, 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 I give you an example. Uh, a few years ago at, at BNP Paribas, we needed uh, to uh, disrupt uh, the way our countries were managed all around the world. So it, was, it had nothing to do with gender equality. It was just uh, we, ha we, we, we had to disrupt our country management system. And at one moment, uh, our C and the country managers had been men for uh, one century and a half. Uh, so. And All that time individually? Yes, probably. No, no, no. They were, they were, they were several of them. Uh, but and 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 at one moment, our CEO Jean Laurent Bonafé uh, started to name a woman as a country manager somewhere. 
in France, we have the, the country manager is a woman. And he started to do this. And now we have in India, the country manager is a woman. In United Kingdom, the country manager is a woman. In West United States, the country manager is a woman. In Spain, it's a woman. And it's a very strong uh, signal that because right. obviously so the, it's making the, the signal it's making a signal uh, so the women are not only something we are uh, 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 looking for with the disruption it's also part of the the fact that uh, we are disrupting the system so, mika you wanted to come in yeah i i, I, I well you, keep going I, I think that this is a very fair point, and uh, as far as my personal life is concerned, but what struck me du during the, the debate we had is that, uh, well, when I was young, which is long ago, uh, I was a sort of alibi. You know what? We have this woman or, or in our organization, okay, she's very ambitious, she wants to do something else, she wants to move on, and she's representative of a sort of animal endangered, I don't know, something like this, maybe we need to protect or whatever. And, uh, and by the way, my origin, I'm, I have a lot of a long list of disruption or, or I, you know, diversity. My origin is Persian, I'm left-hander, but anyway, I have a lot of, you know, disablement. So, uh, but what is really changing is, as you said, we are talking about disruption at large, and sometimes we are scared to put action, to take decision, to, to move forward. And when we decide, and we have this commitment, and I believe more and more that this comes from the top, uh, not all by the sudden, you need to have this really strength to say, I'm gonna do that. And it's global, it's also about environment, it's about diversity, it's about everything we are doing, at the same time that we need to keep the profitability. By the way, when you look at what you, your survey, the profitability of diverse companies is better than anybody else. You have a better di profitability. So when you do that, and sometimes I wonder if I, take, if I took the right decision, but ultimately when you see that the results are there, that everybody is working better and working together and in a very much more inclusive way, then you feel completely encouraged and empowered to, to move forward. And this is about the coherence of what you're doing and if you are coherent, you can be transparent and you can stand up and you can use less capacity to try to remember, okay, I'm, I'm doing, they saying something, doing something else. No, let's have this coherence in mind and in order to develop and deploy our energies. And I, and I agree with that. And what is so important is that we move with intent. I think, you know, to your point about what makes this personal, this evolution isn't just going to happen overnight. I remember being struck a number of years ago, I was at a meeting about women um, parody on corporate boards, and I realized at the pace of evolution, my then six-year-old daughter was gonna be my 80-year-old mother's age by the time we reach 50-50 if we don't move with intent. I have an eight-year-old daughter who wants to be a scientist. She wants to code computer games because she can't find any that she likes because they're all developed by boys. Um, and so to me, I look at this and think, I don't want her ever knowing there are barriers in the way. I don't want anyone ever telling her that girls aren't good at math. And that's so important that we start to clear this out and clear these pathways so she, she doesn't, that this conversation to her seems like an anachronism. I mean, did you feel, and, and, and you know, did you feel, for those of you who were here last year and the previous years, do you feel that we're making progress on that pathway? Are we, you know, there was a sense of progress I felt yes. in the conversation yeah. at lunch. I do think we are. I think we are making more and more progress because of the, the commitments, the explicit commitments of companies, the recognition that this is something that isn't just a nice to have, it's, it's something that we need to get to and that it is becoming for successive generations more and more personal because of experiences like, like Kevin shared, that this is, we're seeing the impact um, and we're seeing the benefits of creating this, this greater diversity. And, and how do we get, you wanted to come in, Maurice, how do we get this to stick? How do we, you know, and, and are, do you share that feeling that we're making progress? I believe we are making progress, uh, but this depends because when you look at some industries, uh, there, there is such a gap. Look at what's happening in the Silicon Valley. 
and uh, the disparity that exists and the difference between uh, uh, the careers of women and what's happening with men. There is a, 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 it's a different world. Um, I, I think that to uh, make things happen, you, you need, in fact, uh, uh, three things which are relatively easy to define but difficult to get. The first one is sincerity. Uh, no bullshit, sorry for the expression. It's sincerity. When the board is making a decision, when the CEO is making a decision, it has to be something, uh, as Kevin said, something that he is taking personal. Uh, it's something which is really he believes in and he, 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 he wants, he or she wants to make it happen. That's the first thing. Sincerity is very important. The second is uh, that um, in every single action uh, that he thought through, and this is a golden rule for everything, not only for gender parity, not only for diversity, uh, including for business objectives. Uh, that there is a regular measurement and you see if you are making progress and if you are not, you have to optimize. And the last one is what we call the acid test. And the acid test is the, the, what we call in French la politique d'acte. When you are, making, uh, you are making a decision, it has to be clear because people read the decision better than they read the words. And if you are making a decision which is not in accord, with what you have said and what you have promised, then people say, okay, this is lip service. These people are not true. And they are not sincere about what their objectives are. So if you say, I want gender equality, you have to make a political act. And political act is like uh, Antoine said, you pick some woman and you promote them even if there are some people who say, hey, it's too soon, uh, uh, you know, maybe we should wait for the next wave, etc. Et you, you, you impose a decision and you say, no, sorry, I'm making that decision because so I want is. to give a clear signal that I'm true to my words and that I want things to happen and I want the people to know that they, they can have hope because we are sincere with our promises. Now, one thing I want to add, uh, I 100% agree. I think uh, what happens most of the time, women are their worst enemy, and they are, you know, they are stepping back and they don't want to promote themselves. And you need to go and look for them and say, okay, maybe they are not the best uh, women, whatever. I mean, women, younger, uh, most dedicated people. But you need to go and tell them, I'm going to I'm encourage you to pick up a new job, a new role, and by the way, we're gonna support you. The same way, and it's about education. One thing I wanted to underline is that, you know what, we are talking about the technology and how much jobs technology will de de uh, destroy because of artificial intelligence, robotic, whatever. And what we are talking about in all our companies in how to retain talent. We are talking about human beings. We are talking about how to value this phenomenal uh, capital we have, which is a human capital. And let's consider that this is the most important value we have. And by the way, this is what makes me feel more encouraged today that our natural intelligence will give us a chance to promote this human capital, which is absolutely priceless. So maybe let's just stick with that for, for a minute. You know, they're seen as two very different things, humans, AI. How do we actually put AI to use? How do we um, take Maker's Point? And were there, were there things that came out, success stories, or things that have worked or would work? There are things that have worked. Um, with any technology shift, it gives us an opportunity to, to reset the boardroom, to reset the rooms in which all these decisions and discussions happen. And I would just observe one very simple thing that we put in our report. No more only moments. What does that mean? There are too many rooms where there's only one woman in the room at any point in time. When I came into my role, we had one woman in our senior team. There are now five. 
When you've got one woman or one of anybody in a room, AI or other topic being discussed, you're prone to be a little quieter, to second guess what you say, to think twice about whether you're gonna make that comment. And more, you actually start to conform. And that doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And the numbers are overwhelming. We know that 40% of women are reporting that they are often the only person in the room when a decision is being made, 40%. That's a staggering number. So we have the onesies and we can point to one person here and one person there. We've made progress when there are five people in a room, not one person. When people are there and they've got the ability to speak up and know that there are other in the room who sort of get what they're saying. So I think the biggest change we can do, no more onlys. And that's true of technology, it's true of day-to-day -day life. And I think when you look around this room, there's no need to have only one person in the room. We can have five every time. That will be the time we have real change. Speaking of time, Kathleen, yeah, quick. I also think we have the opportunity. There's so many young women entrepreneurs there in the field of technology. We've seen a number of them here um, over the last couple of days who are innovating in the areas of AI and, and other technologies. And it's so important that we encourage that to make sure that this next generation, that this digital disruption and technological revolution equally represents women. And again, that's back to moving with intent and making sure that we are changing our own thinking about how do we make this revolution work for, for men and women? I'm going to, um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So I've been asked, as with all the panels, I think, to challenge everybody to make their one-minute commitment. We have one minute between us. So if I could ask that question, what would be your call to action, your commitment for the future? And we'll just run down the line here. Our commitment is clear, is to bring uh, uh, the uh, balance to 50-50 at the executive committee. Uh, I w the thing I would like to add is very often you have CEOs who are making decisions to promote women and what they do, they say, okay, HR, communication, uh, maybe marketing. Marketing is already a bit serious and uh, it's hard to get them in the operation and I think that uh, the best way to show that the really women uh, our core to the strategy is to bring them to the core of the business, where the money is, where the decisions are made, where the future is. Kathleen. Yeah. So Sanofi's commitment, again, I'll reiterate, is we're moving to 50-50 gender parity among our senior leaders by 2025. So that's where we're headed, and we've got the, the systems in place and the metrics in place to achieve that. If we are uh, where we are, it's because there is a, a chain of decision uh, which has uh, always been in favor uh, of men. So we have to change the change of decision and we have to, to change the culture. So we are working on the very in-depth uh, uh, programs to change the culture and this will be uh, a 2019 uh, strong uh, action. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, we are not very far from that, but I commit in the coming period to go to the balance of our management team and to continue also to promote younger women and to encourage them to take up the position and to continue to improve themselves and to at operational level and not you know, at support level, which is good also, but I, mean, I would like to bring that to, to that point. We already have started and we're gonna continue. Uh, three commitments. The first, when we write about something, we do it. We've written a lot about this issue. So I want McKinsey to be the place that actually does everything we write about and does it well. The second thing, no more onlys. I think it really matters that we have five in the room, not one in the room. And the third one, keep it personal. When it's personal, I don't think people want to get on the wrong side of me or anyone else that really cares about it. I care about it because of my wife, my two daughters. I'm sure there are so many of us in this room that have good reasons why it's very personal. Keep it that way. Thank you very much. So we, we're going to close, but I just was going to say, I hope that everybody will be there to um, bring your progress, tell us what you've been up to over the year next year, and bring that commitment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.